The third speaker is going to take us into biocatalysis and in industry. Um, Ryan Fellin is currently at AbbVie. He discovered his love for enzymes and synthetic biology at an early stage in his career uh, while he was an undergrad at Michigan State working with John Frost and Karen Drass. Um, from there, he went on to John Hopkins working with Craig Townsend using synthetic chemistry to probe biosynthetic pathways um, and looking at enzyme mechanism. Um, from there, he moved on to work with Jay Kiesling at Berkeley, um, specifically looking at um, PKS um, expression and host engineering. Um, and he moved to AbbVie in 2017, um, where he's really been building bi the biocatalysis group there. So it's very exciting. Um, and we're looking forward to what you've been up to at AbbVie, Ryan. Uh, can you pull up your slides, Ryan? Yeah, let's... Uh, um... Great, the floor is yours. All right, well, I wanna start off and first thank all, you know, everyone for putting this together and giving me the, um, the opportunity to speak about what, what you've been doing at AbbVie. Um, the process chemistry group there has, um, you know, we've really just started in the past three years working on um, biocatalysis. And so while a lot of other groups talk about transformations, we're really focused on building up um, infrastructure and um, modernizing how we can do these high throughput screens to generate, um, you know, powerful biocatalytic transformations such as you've seen here. And so specifically what I want to talk about is our way to address high throughput screening, um, specifically plate preparation and running these reactions at um, nanomolar scale with, with accuracy. Because um, the problem can be you can run reactions on small scale, but how accurate are they really? And so this is, I think, one more tool that we aim to put into the kit that um, can be complementary to what's already existing out there. Um, so in general, <clears throat> just from a high level, what does a screening process look like? And it's pretty much what you'd expect. You would have your enzymes in a plate, 96, 386 well. Um, the only thing that varies in these reactions, ideally, is just your enzyme. You add your assay components, um, you run your reaction, and then we can go ahead, quench, work up, remove salts, and then analyze however we want to do it, UPLC, LCMS, um, what have you. And so the majority of these um, operations can be done um, in parallel very simply. But one problem that we had was plating enzymes. Every time we wanted to run a, an assay, you know, how deep are we going to screen? Are we going to screen, you know, the 50 that we know are well, you work well, or are we going to look at, you know, in some cases we have over a thousand keto reductases. Do we want to sit there and plate out a thousand different enzymes? Um, and so this is kind of where I started to think about how we wanted to have pre-plates ready to go as, as most people would do that. And what's the format that we would um, have these generated. Um, I've always been a little concerned about, um, well, I guess we can think about a traditional plate preparation where one might take your, um, your Lyo powder, you can hydrate that, you can have a liquid handling robot easily dose those out and you have your hydrated enzyme. Um, you receive a lot of enzymes, I think, Codexes, when you buy some special kits, they come already already hydrated and they say stability is somewhere around six months. Um, I've always been concerned about the stability of enzymes, especially when hydrated. I think I'm probably a little uh, concerned about that. And, you know, grad school, especially postdoc, working with some uh, very unstable proteins made me uh, kind of question how long these enzymes are actually stable for, even though they can be considered stable for, you know, six to 12 months. So the first thing we wanted to do was really just go ahead and kind of do a, a proof of concept or, or have me look at um, keto reductases in particular. Um, and look at, I think we have 94 different keto reductases here. Um, I'm not gonna say which company is which, but then we used um, Codex's Olmec and some Johnson Murph Murphy keto reductases. Um, what we did was run a reaction at time equals zero. So generate the plate, don't even freeze it and go ahead and run the reaction. We then, um, 24 hours later, ran that same reaction and compared the remaining activity. So, uh oh, sorry about that. Um, and so we compared blue was 24 hours later after freezing, and then four was the amount of re remaining activity. Um, not all of these reactions went to 100% completion, but if a reaction was 30% and then 27% the next day, that's, you know, essentially 95% of what the, um, the remaining activity is. 
And so what you see here, 24 hours, the majority of the enzymes um, retain anywhere from you know, full activity to say 30% loss in activity, where over the course of four months, um, here in red now, we see a um, a large number of uh, enzymes that have real severe loss, if not complete and total loss here um, in this case. Um, and so what we were interested in is, you know, are there other ways to really, um, to make this more stable? And one would be lyophilization. So we can go ahead, hydrate, lyophilize, um, and you'd have your cell enzyme dosed in a 96 or um, well-plate format. But again, that adds another operation um, that we need to do. We need to make sure that we have um, lyophilizers that can handle a large number of plates. Um, on site, the majority, if not all of our lyophilizers are GMP material or GMP rated. So that would put in a lot of paperwork for us. Um, we're kind of trying to think about some new and interesting ways that we could possibly get to this um, solid dosed enzyme in 96384 well plate format. Um, so this is right around the time that a publication came out from our um, high throughput chemistry group um, where uh, Noah too, and uh, another group of chemists there, looked at this idea of um, what they called chem beads. And essentially what these are, are um, small glass beads that you can take your, um, your powder of any, your chemical of any um, identity. So different palladium ligands, bases, anything. And basically take your host beads and your guest um, chemical and coat that on the outside of the bead here. And you can see here in these, um, SEM images, you can see the beads actually coated with this powder on there. Um, and what that enables them to do is at a, um, on a very small scale, so nanomolar scale here in a um, 96 well plate format, they can look at different coupling reactions that were quite difficult and look at them with accuracy um, that you wouldn't normally see through dosing, uh, you know, 200 um, micrograms per well of say, XFOS or your other um, palladium ligands. So in talking with Noah, we had a, um, a few discussions, you know, we thought, or Noah thought it might be possible to actually coat these beads um, with enzymes themselves. I was very hesitant in the beginning to believe that we could actually throw the enzymes into an acoustic mixer and, um, and see activity come out on the other end if the enzyme even, even stuck to the uh, bead itself. And so the question was, you know, if we're gonna try this does it make a stable formulation? Does it coat the bead or is there a suspension? Um, you know, what are the forces that would drive this? Uh, it's been thought that it's, you know, actually Van der Waals forces with the, the chem beads that cause these, um, the surface of the, the bead to be coated in your chemical. But these enzymes tend to be much more flocculent, um, you know, really hard to dose out and have a lot of um, electrostatic charge to them. So, you know, possibly if we find the right bead, we could actually coat the outside. So. We went ahead, we have um, four different images under a uh, 60X uh, microscope here. Um, your naked bead, we looked at five, 10 and 20% loading, um, as well as a number of uh, glass beads as well as polystyrene beads. Um, with the glass beads, we found in the bottom of the um, acoustic mixing vial, just the enzyme pool at the bottom with both the um, 0.25 and 0.5 millimeter beads. Um, but polystyrene, you could see the beads almost have this well, they had a coating on them. They looked like there was something adhered to the bead. What we show here is actually, it's not just um, in the case where this is probably overloaded at 20%. What we see here is um, in B and C, the actual majority of the enzyme is stuck to the outside of the bead. Um, and these you know, are, are stable and can resist some um, mechanical shaking. Um, I mean, they come out of the, the mixer and they really seem to be working um, pretty well at this point. So. What we did was essentially set 10% loading as the upper limit. There, there might be a little bit of enzyme that's free floating in there, but for the most part, if you think about these beads not just being two-dimensional image, what you see there, but three-dimensionally coated, there's really, a, in comparison, a little amount of enzyme that's in that kind of uh, the space in between the beads here. Um, importantly, what we show, this isn't an enzyme bead suspension, but this is actually a formulation where the bead is on the surface of the, or the enzyme's on the surface of the bead. Um, and would presumably be liberated by hydration. So initial validation, what we did was take this um, aryl substituted cyclohexanone under standard conditions, um, looked at kinetics over time for three different or uh, four different reactions. 
what we see here is not only do the um, do the beads work, activities retained, but they work in lockstep. Um, the kinetic uh, rate profile um, or over time exactly matches in almost every case, um, except for this one right here. That's the real fast reaction that was, you know, a ten percent difference in bead loading can can cause a difference. But at any rate, um, what we're doing is running reactions here where we can dose in. 10 megs of a bead or five megs of the, the bead um, formulation. On the back end of that, we're only using 500, um, you know, 500 micrograms up to a meg, um, but with real high accuracy matching what you would um, traditionally see coming out of a liquid preparation that's dosed by, um, by PET. So, by PET. so really saving, um, saving time, we can do this by a solid dispensing robot. And we can also do this with, um, we have pre-calibrated scoops that can be, um, produced by uh, 3D printers. So kinetics matched, if you look at the, um, the DR um, that comes out of this reaction also, we have um, you know those properties again match very well, slight variations, but um, this is more of a proof of concept that we should go ahead and really start looking at this and try to validate this um, to build up as a platform. And so that was at the time where um, you know, I was lucky enough, we were about a year into biocatalysis and we were able to um, hire uh, Jesse Brown from uh, Chris Body's group in um, University of Ottawa, and he really took over from uh, from there on out, working on um, validation of this. So, looking at twelve different enzymes, um, three different enzyme classes, we wanted to look at different substrates, and then one of the trials we performed in triplicate to really show what the variation was, um, not only across different substrates and enzymes, but how well are we? You know, what's the accuracy each and every time we dose? So reproducibility, selectivity, um, ultimately kinetic um, comparison stability is what we um, what we aim to show. And then we wanted to again show that we can actually use this with a solid dispensing robot. Um, we've been really interested in how we can leverage the solid dispensing robots to improve throughput. And this is exactly what we're doing: is taking the platforms we have and, and using them in the um, the best manner possible. Down here, I list the enzymes. It, it doesn't really matter. I, I don't talk about specifically whose enzyme is what, but I, I did use some from a, a, a cross section of all the vendors out there. I can say that a lot of these enzymes do have different properties. And so some of them were more difficult to coat um, until we realized that as long as you have a nice dry enzyme, um, the milling actually breaks it up. So residual water in the catalyst can be a problem, but as long as you, um, you go ahead and dry it beforehand, formulation is pretty simple. And that, that's mentioned in the, um, the manuscript we've submitted. So we look here at keto reductase. Um, so the first trial on the left here with the um, this uh, phenyl acid, uh, this substitute acetone here. Um, we did that in triplicate, and what you see is the deviation is slightly higher for the beads than the liquid, 4.2% variation um, as opposed to 2.2. Um, but each substrate, blue being the bead and gray being the um, the standard liquid dosing, um, we see low vari variation, all of them, um, you know, you can easily rank each enzyme activity into a, a high, medium, low, if not more granular than that. Um, on average, we saw about a 0.4% difference with a plus or minus 10%. Um, again, I think this, you know, high throughput screen, the idea is, you know, to try to get hits and with an idea of how well that generally, a catalyst generally works, um, plus or minus 10%, I think was, uh, more than enough for us to really feel that uh, this worked. Again, we looked at um, transaminases, slightly lower um, variation. In a lot of cases here, what we see is more of a, a bimodal high activity and low activity as opposed to the keto reductases where there was a little more, a um, little more in the 40 to 60, 70%. But again, um, you know, variation was low. 2.6% um, on average of the slightly smaller band of variation, about 7% plus or minus um, for all these reactions. And I, and I will mention that all of these plates were prepared um, using a solid dispensing robot. Um, so really using these in the exact way that we'd want to um, implement them in our screening platform at AbbVie. Finally, we looked at um, three different reactions here. So hydrolysis of an ester. Um, so this is just a hydrolysis of a phenylalanine, not a kinetic resolution. Kinetic resolution um, using this light base, as well as a um, desimeterization of this um, diacetate. 
um, to the mono estate, and eventually to the diol. And so again, variation was actually significantly lower here, um, as you see with the um, saponification of this phenylalanine ethyl ester. Um, kinetic resolution, so we're also looking at differential rates now on um, this racemic material. We still see that um, in the screen, they match very well. Um, and even more importantly, I think, you know, driving home the point of stereoselectivity, which we would expect, I guess we can also, I'll go to the next slide in a second here, but um, you average everything out. So all the, um, the nine different trials that we did, um, and we see actually zero, we're right on the nose, plus or minus um, slightly under 10%. So the accuracy seems to really be there. Um, but what I really was excited about was not only do we, um, you know, we see kinetics conserved, and we can talk more about that, um, activity conserved, but you know, even in a more complex reaction where we have two different um, saponification events of the pro-R and pro-S um, center, we, we see them uh, monohydrolysis and dihydrolysis match up very well with about plus or minus 5% difference um, in what you see with the monoacetate diol um, overall product. So that, that again, hints to the idea that no property of the enzyme itself is actually changed in this process of putting the enzyme through an acoustic mixer, which uh, it was very heartening for me. Um, we got, went ahead and did comparison. I know we did comparison earlier with the uh, keto reductase. We also looked at um, transaminase and the lipase in a um, just a time course reaction here. Again, blue being the bead, um, orange being the liquid. Low variation reactions mirror each other very well. Um, this was done with beads that were actually uh, just over a year old. So looking at stability in this, um, as well as the, the competency of these beads in the reaction. Uh, likewise, light base, we used beads that were somewhere around six um, months old. So we really wanted to, to test and see, you know, did we see anything falling off over the course of a year? Um, putting this data together, that's the longest we've gone, but we have, we have faith that these, um, these are actually as stable as the, um, as the Lyle powder would be itself um, in a non-formulated fashion. And again, um, kinetics here, the time course of the reaction matches very well. You really can't tell the difference between the two. Um, stereochemical outcome. Again, um, as I mentioned before, there really isn't much of a difference. This one right here, there's a um, slight difference, but that keto reductase wasn't very active against this. And so there was a lot of background and it, it probably, um, it was really tough to ascertain what peak was what, given that they were kind of more in the weeds of the um, chromatogram than anything else. But you can go through and look at all the data. Um, we put this in the SI of the, the manuscript. Everything matches, even in the case of this um, decimeterization or the, uh, the kinetic resolution where your conversion will affect your um, final stereochemical outcome. We still see um, very close synergy in the um, B to R solution um, final products. Um, and as I mentioned, the, the stability of these um, tested at three, six, 12 months later is right on spot. Um, so overall looking, we wanted to just go ahead and test this. You know, how does it dose into the 96 well plate format? Um, this is a new system that we have from uh, the Quantros Connect. Um, I forget who makes it now, but we're still working through some kinks. So we did have a couple times here, about 5% where it overdosed or um, had dosing problems. But in the cases where it does dose accurately, and we can get an output from the, um, the robot itself, you're about a 10% variation on that. So this, I think, really provides us a, a unique and flexible way to go ahead and dose out our plates, as opposed to some um, more laborious hydration, lyophilization, or other, um, other sequences like that. And so I think what we've been able to show here is a, um, a new complementary tool to aid our um, high throughput capacity. We can do this um, not only with one enzyme, we're able to multiplex different enzymes. We can actually put, um, we put reactions on a bead, <clears throat> pardon me, where you could have a keto reductase with your um, GDH, glucose, all your recycling cofactors, and be able to accurately scoop out um, a reaction, add buffer in your buffer and substrate, and you're kind of ready to go off uh, right there. So that to us is something for assays that we run quite repetitively. Um, it's a really easy way for us to set up and go with a reaction um, such as that. So the really, I think what we've demonstrated here is there really isn't any difference between um, the liquid dosing of a lyo powder and um, the beads themselves. 
We have increased stability versus hydration um, and really we're able to prepare five grams of these beads. And our, our thought is they're gonna last us for the next three, five years and allow us to um, pull out the enzymes we need, dose a plate in whatever kind of format we want and um, provide a lot more flexibility to that. Um, the robot really um, assists us in that and it really opens the door for a lot of custom, um, custom plates, multi-catalyst screens and things of that nature where you might be stuck into one um, format given a you know, more traditional uh, liquid dosing. And so with that, I just wanna thank um, Abby for a chance to really do exciting, um, great science. Jesse did the, the vast majority of this work and really um, you know, pushed us in the direction to get this, um, get this done, not just for our internal understanding, um, but to make a nice manuscript out of it and have that um, it's currently under review right now. Um, and then, you know, I have to thank Noah. He was, um, it was great working with him, trying to push us in a direction that I thought might have been counterproductive, putting an enzyme into a, uh, a ball mill and acoustic mixer. But in the end, it, uh, it all worked out well. So with that, I just want to thank everyone again for uh, taking the time to listen. And I would love to take any questions. Thanks, Ryan, for a great talk. We're sending you virtual applause. Um, it's interesting to hear about this major initiative you've undertaken at AVI. Um, I have a number of questions. I'm not sure if we have any yet in the chat, so I'll start out um, and just asking you about, have you looked at um, co-mobilizing enzymes, uh, either enzymes that need to work together or for cascade processes or um, is there an impact if you throw in um, beads with two different enzymes on their activity working together in cascades? So we haven't looked at that, but I don't think there'd be any any reason to think so. Um, you know, we, we think about this not only with the, um, you know, the enzyme cascades are, are one thing, but there's a lot of other, um, you know, we think of, um, we're trying to think of catalysts, not just biocatalysts, but a lot of these um, cross-coupling metal mediated transformations or even photocatalytic ideas where these beads can allow you to rapidly generate a, um, a matrix of different, um, you know, different substrates that you could use in these. Um, so I, I think we, we want to think about biocatalytic cascades, but also I think the idea of to get apply this to other um, chemoenzymatic transformations is something that we really, we really think this gives us the flexibility to, to put together those types of screens and things of that nature. Yes, so um, you know the, the concern is always does this actually translate into scalability? And so in the, the few cases that we have tried it, it, it does. Um, I think you know out of a hundred hundred enzymes, you find a couple and kind of go with what your uh, what your gut tells you the best one is. Um, and we really I don't think we even need to backtrack to a choice number two. You know, at, at the phase that we're using them where we're um, preclinical trials and looking at maybe you know somewhere in the 500 to a kg delivery, um, we're able to, to get it to reasonable loading um, and make a, a fit for the purpose um, by like a little transformation to, to, address, um, to address those kind of reactions. And so we've been able to do that, you know, turn around from screen to sending out a tech package to somebody to be, you know, a, a week. We've been able to do it fairly, uh, fairly rapidly. Maybe I can just go with one then, Ryan. So, is, are there, have there been any enzymes or enzyme classes that have really proved intolerant to your uh, methodology? So, we, we did have concerns over um, some of the white bases that came from fungal sources versus bacteria. But I think we've sorted that out more as a function of the, function of the moisture that's in the, um, in the panel itself, not the, um, the properties. So a lot of these, some of the enzymes in sigma are almost like sea light, where um, other companies are very flocculent um, and behave extremely well, but I think we've come down to the point where as long as the enzyme is dry um, during the co-milling and, um, 
but we look at the mixing and the enzyme is broken up enough where we um we don't see activity we do see coding on the outside of the bead for for everything we've tried so we looked at keto base trans enzymes like this and yeah some other glucose dehydrogenase um lactic and you know other recycling cofactors such as that so nothing yet and i and i don't think I, I can't envision a, a class that would be so drastically different than these other um, classes that they wouldn't be able to localize themselves on the beat or retain their activity. I think it's a function of what the self-reacts rate lyle powder is itself, and that just happens to be put on a, um, a non-covalent support. And we, we do have one yeah. more question online. Have we got time, Allison? Is that yeah, so, go for it. Uh, so a question from Brett, you should hopefully be able to talk now. Yeah, hey, what's up, Brian? Hi, buddy. Um, so I'm not sure whether you mentioned it, uh, but for enzymes that do require cofactor, can you can you load the hollow complex or do you have to add the cofactor to the assay once you hydrate the beads? So you can you can put the cofactors into it. So we've we've done a set of beads where we had um, different keto reductases, and then we had um, glucose dehydrogenase, glucose NADP. Um, I think that's all we needed done there. Um, so one, we could have the idea of just a cofactor bead that we could broadly distribute, or you could make the whole reaction on a bead itself and drop that in. Gets in the buffer, dissociates, and you're off and running. Cool. Thanks. So we had another question in the chat from Brad Moore, which I think might be an interesting uh, question for us to think about talk or talk about together. So Brad, you should be able to talk. Allison, thank you for letting me talk. Um, so the question I posed in, in the chat was, you know, we hear a lot today about biocatalytic cascade reactions, you know, chemists use that term differently than how it's being discussed here. You know, chemists describe a, a cascade as a, um, mm -hmm. in which um, one catalyst facilitates a multi-step reaction series. Um, here, however, you know, bi biocatalytic cascades are single reactions grouped together by multiple enzymes in a one pot reaction. So, you know, my, I guess the discussion for me is like, you know, should the two communities come to some kind of consensus on how to use this term of a cascade? Ryan, you want to take that one? Yeah, I, mean, I guess I think, I mean, it, it's tough because I think that the two groups are distinct enough where they're maybe a little set in the ways of how they would would go about doing that. But it's, it's an interesting thought of certainly how, you know, we use a biocatalytic cascade is more of a emulation of metabolism versus, you know, another um, the more chemically defined route. I, I think somebody needs to make a case for which one is actually proper and who needs to change their way of thinking, um, which could be somewhat difficult. But I'll, I'll let uh, the rest of the panel weigh in on that. I bring it up because, you know, as the two communities begin to fuse together as using enzymes in, in bio, you know, using enzymes in catalysis, then it just raises confusion, however, when these two different groups get together. And words mean a lot. So it's nice to be able to, so, you know, be able to use the terminology appropriately. Chris Walsh and I wrote a review last year on on biocatalytic cascades, but we use the chemical terminology in that review article on Gavanta Chemie on you know enzymes, single enzymes that catalyze multi-step reactions. So that's my point. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting um, one to put out there. Does anybody else either from the audience? from the attendees or the panelists want to comment? Do we have anybody? 
So I've spent a time thinking about cascade versus sequence, where a true cascade means that you have to generate an intermediate for the next step, right? Versus a sequence um, where you have to have sequential addition of some reagent that then triggers the next step. But good conversations. <laughs>